with us virtually. Uh, we're we're blessed to have a we're, we're blessed to have a, a congregation that uh, tunes in either way, and we appreciate the uh, people in the back that provides uh, provides that for us. Uh, tonight we're going to be looking uh, at Acts 13. We're going to be finishing that off, if you recall, and going on into uh, Acts 14. And I'd like to uh, do a little a review just to kind of get our our minds circulating, if you will, sort of stirred up as we try to figure out where we came from and where we are, where, where uh, I believe Brian left off. Uh, but before we do that, if you would, let's pray. Our righteous Heavenly Father, we're grateful that we can come before you, come before you in this building and and not only in this building, but virtually that we can worship you and, and magnify your name and honor you. We ask our Heavenly Father as we look at Acts that We'll be very mindful that it's a story about us, that we need to go tell the good news. And we can identify with Paul and all the tribulations that he's going through, that as we go through things in our life at this time, we can persevere because you are with us. Our Heavenly Father, be with me as I speak and be with those that are listening, that we can all be encouraged. Our Heavenly Father, bless us, keep us, and always forgive us, for it's in Christ's name. Amen. All right, so as we kind of get going, we're, we're in the uh, kind of uh, study his word portion of our, of our cycle. And kind of like I mentioned, we're talking about go tell the good news. And I'd like to kind of uh, step back a little bit, if, if we could, uh, when, when we start talking about this, and uh, think about where did we start? Where did we start? Can you, can you remember? Can you, can you see this, I hope? This, where did we start? Does anybody remember? This is Paul. He's getting ready to start his first journey, and where was it? Antioch of Syria. I don't know if you can see it too well, but it's over here. All right, Antioch. All right, that's where we started. So uh, we move forward, and where did we go next? I don't know if you can see this, but uh, it's a sort of a sort of small here, but uh, in Seleucia, right? Seleucia, right? And we move forward to. Where? Cyprus, that's right. And why did we go to Cyprus? Barnabas, that's right. That's that's a good... It's sort of slow. All right, we got a slow boat tonight. Look there. So then we uh, cross on over and we go to, to uh, uh, Paphos. I don't know why it's so slow. It doesn't usually do this, but that's okay. Um uh, hopefully the others won't be like this, but that's okay. So we go uh, into uh, Paphos, and then where do we go from there? Uh, other end of the island, to, yeah, to Paphos, and then we go to, we go up to Perga, right? Perga. What happens in Perga? Anything particular? Mark leaves, that's right. Is Paul happy about that? Mm, no, not so much. So, uh, once we get to, uh, hopefully this, it won't be slow during the other, it would take forever. So anyway, then where do we end up? Where do we end up uh, after we leave Perga? Where, where we started, that's right. Remember we were in Antioch. Uh, it's just going to take some time to kind of roll through these, uh, through these maps. I'm sorry, sometimes uh, you see it one way at, at the house, if you will, and then you see it another way here. So we're in Perga, and then we go up uh, into Pisidia, and then we're uh, up in uh, Antioch, as you can tell. All right, so that's where we left off. And what happened in what happened in Antioch? What did Paul do? He preached a lesson, right? He he preached to the people there, right? And it was about the grace of God that that that. Well, they 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 didn't they didn't stone him there, but. We're soon going to find out that they didn't like his message, right? So this is where we this is where we're picking up. So there was a there was a message that was delivered, and so we're going to look at the effects of that. We're going to look at the uh, effects. So we're in Acts 13, 40, uh, 42 through forty eight. So uh, we'll read this, and then we will kind of look at it. So Acts thirteen, forty two. As Paul and Barnabas were going out, the people kept begging that these things might be spoken to them the next Sabbath. 
Now, when the meeting of the synagogue had broken up, many of the Jews of the God-fearing, uh, and of the God-fearing proselytes followed Paul and Barnabas, who, speaking to them, were urging them to continue in the grace of God. The next Sabbath, nearly the whole city assembled to hear the word of the Lord. But when the Jews saw the crowds, they were filled with jealousy and began contradicting the things spoken to Paul and were blaspheming. Paul and Barnabas spoke out boldly and said, It was necessary that the word of God be spoken to you first, since you repudiate it and judge yourselves unworthy to, uh, of eternal life. Behold, we are turning to the Gentiles. For so the Lord has commanded us, I have placed you as a light for the Gentiles, that you may bring salvation to the end of the earth. When the Gentiles heard this, they began rejoicing and glorifying the word of the Lord. And as many as been appointed to eternal life believed. So let's look at some stuff. What are some of the immediate effects here as we as we look at this section? Well, we know we talk about they were excited to hear it, right? They were excited to hear it, right? They're excited to hear it. But we see that I want to kind of highlight this as we as we kind of finish this part up. I think Brian touched on it a little bit as we're exiting uh, this immediate effects. It talks about the grace of God. Now, I've got a question. When you talk about the grace of God, do you see that as someone being saved or not? It seems like it, but were these people saved? They heard the message, right? What else did they do? Anybody repent? That we know of. Anybody confess? That we know of. No, so we have to be very careful. This grace of God was not supposed to be directly that they were saved, right? Because we, we look back, uh, let's see, uh, Acts chapter 2. What did they do there? They repent and be baptized. What about Acts chapter 8? What happened with Philip and uh, Simon the sorcerer and, and those, those people there? What happened there? And they believed and were baptized. And then what about uh, 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 the Ethiopian eunuch? What happened there? What hinders me to, and what did they do? Baptize. We don't see anything there. So we need to make sure that we don't think that the grace of God in and of itself is talking about salvation. Just wanted to highlight that. What was the grace of God? It was that God had sent Paul and Barnabas to them so they could hear what they needed to do. All right? All right. So there was some uh, later effects that we, as we, as we kept uh, reading through here, right? I got a question. Who did they go to first? Right at the very beginning of 13, where did they go first? To the, to the Jews, to the synagogue. And, and Brian highlighted this in the last class, if you'll remember, right? And why was that? Why did they go there? Anybody remember? Sort of two reasons in a sense. That's right. Romans 1, uh, 16, and, and Brian had that. He's telling them, you're going to go to the Jews first and then to the Gentiles, to the Greeks. Remember, that was way back in Acts chapter 1, verse 8. What did Jesus say? Go to Jerusalem first, then to where? Uh, Judea and Samaria, and then on out to the rest of the world, right? So we're following that same pattern. Also, it makes sense. Uh, I think someone brought this up. When we go there, Who's going to know about the history of Judaism in the Jews? The people in the synagogue, right? It makes sense. So they spoke to the Jews first, and we understand why. Now, what did the Jews think about that? Did they say, I have been waiting for you, Paul? No, they didn't say that. They didn't say that. They rejected his message, right? They didn't want to hear any part of that. They didn't want to hear any part of it. So with that being said, was Paul going to stop? Was Paul going to stop preaching because the Jews didn't want to hear it? No, he didn't. You know why? Because he goes back to Isaiah and Isaiah and he's showing them, look, if you won't listen, it doesn't mean I stop. It means I go to the Gentiles. And I think it's interesting that he goes back to the Old Testament to talk to the Jews. He's not using, uh, you know, Greek mythology or something like that that may be common around there. He's using the Old Testament, and they should have known this. And he's talking to them. He says, 
you know, I have placed you, you know, uh, as a light for the Gentiles. And notice at the end of it, it talks about to the end of the earth. Doesn't that sound like the end of Acts 1 and 8? So this is Paul fulfilling that. What about the, and what about the, uh, and what about the, uh, the Gentiles? What did they think about that? They loved it. Finally, someone's coming to talk to us. Isn't that nice? You know what? We're Gentiles. We're not Jews. And you know what? Jesus talks to us. Sorry, I've got the electronic Bible right here. He talks to us. So I think it's wonderful that he talks to us. But he also talks to the Jews, if, if they, you know, not as a nation that he selected. But what we're talking about here is everybody is unified in Christ. Okay? So there's another thing that, that we see here uh, sort of at the end. It talks about appointed to eternal life. And just, I just want to highlight this uh, quickly. When we talk about appointed to eternal life, does that sound like predestination? It has that ring to me. So when I was looking through it, I was like, I, there is predestination like in, uh, what is it, uh, Ephesians. talks about God has predestined Jesus for our method of sal salvation. But he hasn't said, well, you're going to heaven and you're not. He's not said that. We don't see that. But we could read this if we're not careful into this, in, into this section, if you, if you will. But let's have a look. So who were appointed to uh, the, that life, to, to the eternal life? Let, let's ask this. So who weren't the unbelieving Jews? Why were the unbelieving Jews not, quote, unquote, appointed to that eternal life? What does it say? They rejected the message. Yes. Unworthy That's right. of eternal life. And, and you know, I, I have a note here, it's always our choice. That's it's right. Always everybody's, it's always each person's choice. You either choose to accept it or you choose not, not to. But it's there. Right. And, and that's that right. It's there. That's right. Whether we accept it or not is our choice. We have to choose that, correct? And I think that's an important point because notice God didn't judge them. Who judged them? They judged themselves. And they said it was unworthy, not that it was too high, but this was too low. I'm not going to associate myself with such. I've got Moses. I've got the Ten Commandments. I come from Abraham. So you see how that kind of rolls, right? It's, it's, it tells us that they are not condemned because God said so. They're condemned because they chose not to accept that avenue of eternal life. And we see at, at sort of at the end there, who, who, who's, who's, who's got this uh, appointed eternal life? Those who choose. And who might that have been? Whoever believes. John 3.16. Whoever believes. Is it just the Gentiles? Is it just the Jews? Whosoever. So, we're talking about the believing Gentiles here. That's sort of who he's talking about here. So in other words, we're not predestined. There's not a predestination here at all. It's just saying who is going to believe and who is not. Who is going to follow that eternal uh, purpose? All right. Very good. So now we're ready to sort of roll on to the next section. We're going to finish out 13 here. Uh, we're going to be in 49 to 52. So let's read that. Uh, Acts 13, 49. And the word of the Lord was being spread throughout the whole region. But the Jews incited the devout women of prominence and the leading men of the city and instigated a persecution against Paul and Barnabas and drove them out of their district. But they shook, the, they shook off the dust of their feet in protest against them and went to Iconium. And the disciples were continually filled with joy and with the Holy Spirit. So it's very interesting here. So we're, as, we, as we finish this up, so obviously what was being spread here? The Word, right? The Word was being spread. Where was it spread? Did they say, we can only do this in Antioch of Pisidia? 
Well, we know that's not the case because we started in Antioch of Syria. So it was being spread out, right? Who did that? Got a question. Who did that? Do you think Paul made it his own mission that I'm going to not sleep, I'm not going to eat, I'm not going to do anything, I'm going to be out, I'm going to preach all the time? No, I don't think that's what happened. I really think Paul's main mission was to stay and to, you know, build the church, create the member, you know, create the members, uh, preach it so they could become members and believe. Who heard these? Who heard this word? Who heard the message? Those other people. And what did they, the, the, the people there in, uh, in Antioch, and what did they do? They wanted to do what? They wanted to ha hear it again, what, the next Sabbath, right? So they're going out and telling people, hey, you need to come down here and hear this. So that's a good lesson for us. It's not really, quite frankly, up to just Brian. It's not up just to the deacons, the elders, or whatever. You know, we're all a peculiar priesthood. So they're out teaching and preaching. And, and guess what happens? They all come in, right? They all come in and they want to hear that. And what actually happens there at the, at, as we close 13? What, what actually happens? The Jews were, once again, they were really happy again, weren't they? They were just so excited. No, they weren't happy. They got people riled up. And guess what happens? They tell Paul, and they tell Barnabas, leave, get out. We, we don't want to hear this. Like, what now? See you later. That's what Terry says. See you later. And that's what happened. So they got riled up, and guess who? Who went out? Paul and Barnabas. And I want you to notice them. They were forced out. They were forced out. They were forced out. Let's just keep that in our mind. They were forced out. Well, the question is, where did they go? That's right. They went to Iconium, and we're going to have a, a nice long uh, uh, journey here. Yes, sir. Yeah, we got a headwind going here. It, it goes into Iconium, so I'm going to, you know where Iconium is. I hope you do. If you, if you don't ask me, I'll, I will, I'll get my map out, and I'll look at it. <laughs> the boat's going too slow. I, I need to tell Paul's a uh, guy to get him to go a little faster there. So as we as we move along here, as we move along into uh, Acts, I, 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 uh, Acts 4, I want to kind of talk a, a little bit about the map. This area right here is called a region, a, a Roman region, or you know what I'm saying? And so this was, uh, this was uh, Asia Minor, or, or uh, we might also call it Anatolia. So this is a region, okay? So think about that. So when we come here, what I'm hoping you can see, I hope you can hear me too, is this is that same region, right? And these are provinces within that region. If we go a little further, what we find is there are districts within the provinces. See the same area? We had Galatia here, and that's where we're basically talking about. And we're going to be going into Lyconia here. We were in Pisidia. What, what was in Pisidia? Antioch, right? So, with, so what we're going to see on the next slide, oops, sorry. what we're going to see now, I, I don't know if you can see this too well. This is Paul's journey, and so what you're going to see is there's Lyconia, and there's Pisidia, and then you see Lystra, and Iconium, and Derby, and then you see up here, here's Antioch. So you see that laid over that. So uh, this is a struggle to find this stuff, and uh, I, I know Brian made a mention, made a, a note about that. It's hard to find these maps because they move around a lot, because some of it from from the older um, borders and such like that. But anyway, so uh, so we're going to move on here. So now we're in Acts, and where are we at? We're in Iconium. Now, Iconium is present day Kanya. I think you can kind of figure that out, Kanye in present day Turkey. Can you see a word that we use in English from Iconium? Icon, that's right. And it's a little Greek to me. See, I even put some Greek in there. So you can say, hey, I'm expanding my uh, mental capacities there. So you have icon. So it means a graphic or an image. So that's what that means. So as we roll through, this is some of the uh, old ancient ruins sort of around that area. I don't think that it's right there close, and you'll see why here in just a few minutes. 
I did find another picture. This was sort of uh, Iconium, Kanya, around that time. Uh, not around that time, around 1,000. And, and you can see it's still uh, a large ongoing uh, city, if you will. And then today, ooh, it looks nice to me. That's about the sixth or seventh uh, largest city, uh, as I would understand it, in, in Turkey. So it's, you know, an ongoing concern. So as we kind of get ourselves back, what was the outcome? So they went there and they preached, right? We, we went there and we preached. And, and so what happened? Well, let's read. So we're in Acts 4, or 14, excuse me, 1 through 7. In Iconium, they entered the synagogue of the Jews together and spoke in such a manner that a large number of people believed, both Jews and Greeks. But the Jews who disbelieved stirred up the minds of the Gentiles and embittered them against the brethren. Therefore, they spent a long time there speaking boldly with the reliance upon the Lord, who was testifying to the word of His grace, granting that signs and wonders be done uh, by their hands. But the people of the city were divided. Some sided with the Jews and some with the apostles. And when an attempt was made by the, both the Gentiles and the Jews with their rulers to mistreat and to stone them, they became aware of it and fled to the cities of Lyconia, uh, cities of Lyconia, Lystra and Derbe, and the surrounding region. And there they continued to preach the gospel. So what happens here? We see that there's preaching. Where was it? Where did they start? I know this is a surprise. They went to the Jews first. And they would also preach to the Gentiles, right? Because it's what they're talking about here. So, with that being said, what was the outcome of this? What happened? They, they would preach boldly, right? Now, it, it's important to kind of think about that because uh, what does Romans 10, 17 talk about? That's right. If you don't hear the word. And he the way it emphasized it, he was he was bold. He, he preached it. Think about it. They just ran him out of one town, and so he comes into another, so he's preaching boldly. You would think he would be, well, let's keep this a little bit on the down low. I, I don't want to get stoned. But he didn't. What did he do? He preached boldly. There were signs and things like that. But there was, you know, they got, should we believe them? Should we believe him? Nah. So then guess what happened? They're going to run him out of town. They're going to, they're, they're, they're tired of it. That was in, uh, in, in uh, Antioch of Pisidia. And here they say, hey, let's stone this guy. So he finds out about it. And so they leave, right? They fled. Just remember that. And I, in, in Antioch, what happened? They just told him to leave. Here they were going to stone him. They didn't get to him. They didn't get to him, but he left, right? And so where would he go? Lystra. That's, okay, so we're going to go past this. So, well, here, let's do this. So, we were here, we came up through here, we went to Antioch, down to Iconium, and now we're, we're heading, you know, down into Lystra. So, with that being said, <clears throat> um, now we're kind of at the, at the back part of this. So, when we talk about Lystra, Lystra's a little bit different. Lystra is near, and I wish uh, uh, Ashe Van Cleef was here. She could tell us how to say these words in, in Turkish. I can't. You're going to hear, you're going to hear English. Near a little town called Gokirt. Now, right beside that is is uh, Calistra, and Calistra is where a, a church, an old church, is. And on top or below that church is what I understand is where Lystra was. So you can see Lystra, Calistra. So let, let's have a look. So it doesn't really exist now. It's kind of under rocks, and you'll kind of see that. So here is this church, this, I think it's called St. Paul's Church, and underneath that is, is where Lystra was. And this is really hard to see, I'm certain, but there are little houses and, and stuff here. And it's sitting up on a mountain because they wanted to, they placed it where they could see out and they could see enemies coming. This is just a small town. There's not much to it anymore. So, I mean, maybe you want to go on vacation. I don't know if that's going to be on the top of your list, but hey, you know, it's a biblical city. <clears throat> so what was the outcome? What was the main thing happen that happened at, at Lystra? What was the main thing? 
healing. That's right. There was a healing, and it was of a, a guy who sprang his ankle two days ago, just before Paul came into town. So he, you know, got his magical elixir. No, that's not what happened. He was, he was lame from birth. Did everybody know that? Yes, they did. So when the lame man could walk, what did they do? They were, wow. Now, let's be honest. If, um, let's think. Uh, let's say um, somebody broke their leg, and the very next day they came running in here. That would have been amazing. So we understand that amazement. Okay, so let, let's not fool ourselves there. But they do make a mistake. Somebody, I think Debbie was saying, they thought they were gods, and they said, hey, this, this is Zeus, and this is uh, Hermes, and yeah, and then you have uh, Jupiter and Mercury. So it's, one's Greek and one's Roman, and I wasn't very good at all that stuff. But anyway, I know they're saying that's who these people are. Paul went crazy. He's like, do not call me that. This is not who we are. He even tore his clothes as a symbol of how distraught and upset he was. And why is that? Isn't it okay to say, hey, I'm about as good as God, you know? No, it's not. Can we think of another example in Acts when that happened? <clears throat> what about, yes, Will? A magician when Jesus, are you talking about Simon the sorcerer, maybe? Okay, this was in Acts, that's true, and this was at, uh, that was after Jesus had gone to heaven. So there was some, he, he didn't attribute anything to Jesus, but he was looking to buy something from the apostles so he could lay hands on. So it's something similar, yes. I, I think we had... Well, yeah, well, yes. So, well, how how did Paul react to it? And how did Peter react to it? They said, no, 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 not me. Remember, Peter said, don't think, don't be amazed. Because I didn't do it. If I did it, be amazed. But I didn't do this. Paul's saying, don't call me a God because I'm not a God. Remember, he said, I'm flesh and blood just like you. We're the same. There, there's a there's a lot a lot to that. God's God and we're not. And I'd like to I like for us to uh, explore a little bit here. I, I I've come up with four that are sort of not like these like uh, Peter and Paul. So let's turn to Exodus chapter five, if you would. Exodus chapter five. Exodus five. We're going to look at verse two real quick. There's uh, we're going to go through four of them sort of quickly. Pharaoh, uh, we're going to talk about Pharaoh first. Pharaoh, um, Exodus 5, verse 2. <clears throat> so Pharaoh said, who is the Lord? Can you imagine asking that question? Who is the Lord? That I should obey him and let, the, and let Israel go? I do not know the Lord and I will not let Israel go. Can you see that arrogance, that disrespectful nature how did it turn out for Pharaoh? Not so good. His, 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 his country was plagued several times. Yes. Office. He was a god to them. Yeah. And he saw himself as god. As a god. Yeah. So, yeah, there's like a, a double here. So like Cindy mentioned, so the, they were seen, the, 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 the Pharaoh was seen as a god. But what happens? He gets his, most of his army wiped out. He has plagues. They, they, remember, when the, when, when the Israelites left, what did, they, what did the Egyptians give them? A lot of gold and silver? I mean, that didn't turn out so well to, dis, to disrespect God. Well, let's just turn a little bit further. Exodus 20.10. Exodus 20.10. This is somebody we know. Exodus 20.10, Moses, Exodus 20.10, and Moses and Aaron gathered the assembly before the rock, 
And he said to them, listen now, you rebels. Notice what he says here. Shall we bring forth water for you out of the rock, out of this rock? We. Now, we could be looked at as, as, as either Moses or Aaron or Moses or God. But the last I heard, God was the one that did that. What happened to Moses? He was punished. And what happened? He couldn't go into the promised land. See, when you get, take credit where credit's not due, things typically happen that you don't like. What about Job? Job 38. Let's go look at Job 38. Job was a very patient man. Can you imagine having all the things that happened to him happen to you? All the things. Livestock wiped out. His, 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 his family was wiped out, except for his wife. He had boils and stuff like that. And, and I note, and note that God would allow his, life, his wife to live and his God uh, and blah. And his wife would say, curse God and, and die. So all the things that he, you know, could, could save him, <laughs> that he wanted with his family and things like that, not save him, but the things that he, that he enjoyed. And I has, I, I'm certain he loved his wife, but the things were so harsh on him. And so here we get to uh, Job 38, 1 and 2. And notice what it says here. Then the Lord answered Job out of the whirlwind and said, Who is this that darkens counsel by words without knowledge? He's saying, and who are you to start talking to me like that? And he goes on to say, I think there's a sort of a, a, a nice list of things that he did. I mean, he's saying, were you there when I laid the foundation of, of, of the world? No, he wasn't. Do you know the measurement of all that? No, he doesn't. Did you ever create a sunrise? I don't think you did. There's many things that he talked about. And so he's basically saying in Job, be careful how you ask these questions and to whom you ask them to. Brian brought this one up. Let's go to, uh, let's go to Acts. Acts chapter 12. Acts chapter 12. We're going to be in verse 21 here. Acts chapter 12, verse 21. On an appointed day, Herod, that is, Herod Agrippa, having put on his royal apparel, took his seat on the rostrum and began delivering, delivering an address to them. So far, so good. Makes sense. The people kept crying out, the voice of a God and not of a man. So far, I guess so good, though that was really a sin of theirs. But so far, so good for Herod Agrippa. In between verse 22 and 23, Herod Agrippa could have said something or done something, but what did he choose to do? Nothing. Nothing. And he had that disposition, I think, in general. Why? Because notice what it says in 23. And immediately, immediately, an angel of the Lord struck him because he did not give God the glory. Right? What if he had said, no, 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 hold on, hold on. I, I may be a good orator. Yes, that's true, but I'm not a God. Maybe, yeah, I went and I got a degree in communication and I, you know, I'm able to say things well or, or I have a lot of good facts and I can help you out or whatever it is. He didn't do that. So what I want us to understand is this healing really illustrates the, the way we need to look at God. And I think this is a big problem in the world. We don't see God for who he is. We've missed the bus on that. I wouldn't say us generally, but we have to be careful because we have to look in the mirror each and every day and determine, are we treating God like this? Apostle Paul and Apostle Peter did not. I don't think Paul did. Why? Because it wasn't long, you know, back in Acts chapter 8, what was he doing to, to Jesus? And what was he doing to Jesus' church? How stinging that would be for someone to tell Paul, oh, you're like a god. No, I'm not. I'm so bad. I'm least in the kingdom. And look what I was doing before. It wasn't that long ago. 
What about Peter? Who was the apostle that denied him three times? It was Peter. Peter's like, don't confuse me with God because I should have known that I denied him. Both of the men would rebound. Don't get me wrong. We see here in Acts chapter, as we go from Acts to, uh, to the very end, uh, beginning of Acts, end, we see these men rebound. We can rebound if we mess up. But I think it's very important. I wanted to kind of highlight how we treat God. Can we ask God a question? Yes, we can ask him a question. Just keep in mind, he's going to answer us the way he sees fit. And he's also going to, we also have the appropriate attitude in approaching God. All right. Uh, so that's the first spell. So we have a few minutes left here. All right. So with that being said, <clears throat> what happens to Paul here? In 19 through 20, this is kind of the last section uh, as we uh, finish up this evening. So what happens to Paul here? Did they just force him out of the city? Like in Antioch, or Pisidia? Well, what about like up in uh, Iconium? Did they find it? I'm certain somebody must have told him, this is coming for you, Paul. You better get out of here. What happened? That's right. What happened to Paul? He was stoned. I guess there's worse things that could happen, but can you imagine being stoned? Just let that just sink in, being stoned. I don't know all the details, but I do know in some ways what they would do, and I'm not going to go too far because it's really quite frankly too graphic. They would bury you up to your hips where you couldn't get away. It's not like you're running and, oh, I missed him. I'll pick up another rock. That's not how it worked. And you would be surrounded by people. And I have seen some things where they would put something over you, some kind of blanket or quilt or something, a covering where you couldn't see who's going to throw it at you. And I'll stop right there because I think you have in your mind enough to go on what happened. He was stoned. Who did that? His enemies from the other cities. We should have... Those, those people in, in uh, Antioch, we should have stoned this guy, but we sent him out. Oh, did you hear? Let's go to Lystra. He es escaped from the people in Iconium. Ooh. Let's go down to Lystra. We'll catch him. We'll stop him now. I had talked about before, does death ever stop the proclamation of Christ and his word? No. It's based on a death. It's based on the death of Jesus. So by definition, it can't be stopped by death. He recovered. There's no doubt in my mind there was a miracle, a supernatural miracle. No one can go through what we just talked about and get up the next morning and go somewhere. Not possible. I'm not, I'm not a doctor or nurse or anything like that, but I mean, you don't have to have too many medical degrees and courses to understand that. But what I want you to understand is there was another thing that we really need to learn. If that happened to you the next morning, would you get up and saddle your donkey or whatever you needed to do or walk or whatever to the next place and preach the gospel of Christ when you know that's, that's happened and happened and happened? That's what Paul did. He recovered, but he also stayed solid. So pretty interesting. Big lesson us. Yes, sir. God didn't spare Paul from the pain. He, he had, Paul had the strength to overcome, but God didn't prevent him from being stoned. He was stoned, and he felt that. And remembered it for us. Yeah, Jared was talking about That's right, because I mentioned that, I think, in one of my Lord's Supper talk. So what Jared is saying is, God could have said, this is my guy, Paul. Ooh, I can't have him killed. So here, let's have him hidden somewhere. He was stoned. It's recorded. And that, and that stoning caused a great deal of pain. So it wasn't, 
you know, that happens to us. We, we have issues that, that occur and we, and, and we have to endure them, like, like Jared was saying. Uh, Bill, yes, sir. Quick, quick, quick. Stephen, when he was dumb, and he was standing there holding his coats of all those people. That's right. That, you know, that, that's going to be stinging too. You know, maybe I kind of deserve a little bit of this because I was the one watching and I didn't say anything. Who knows? Uh, so where did he go? The Derby. And just to kind of tie us into the next lesson, where did he go from Derby? Remember, he kind of repeated his course as he would go back and strengthen the Christians. That's right. So, <clears throat> oh, oh, yeah, there we go. So read page 81B to 84 for uh, next week in the corresponding scriptures. Thank you very much for your attention and uh, your comments.